Bye. All right, thank you very much. And welcome everyone to the May um, Center for Excellence in Disabilities at West Virginia University Ability Grand Rounds presentation. We're excited uh, for Dr. Freer to join us. Um, he is um, on leave and including us during that time. So we are very appreciative of him sharing his expertise. You can see the, the title that we're gonna be talking about today, uh, particularly on ableism and children's attitudes towards disability. I know this will be one near and dear to many attendees' hearts. Before we get into that content, I do wanna remind people um, to mute your background, but with that, to encourage your involvement, your questions, your sharing your thoughts. The chat room is open and available as we go, and we'll be monitoring that. Um, and and then taking questions um, during this session. So with that, let me introduce our speaker for just a few minutes. Um, Dr. Freer is a professor in the School of Community Studies at St. Clair College in Windsor, Ontario. He is the coordinator of the Educational Support Program and helps to train students interested in pursuing a career in special education. He's also an adjunct assistant professor in the Faculty of Education and Department of Psychology at the University of Windsor, where he teaches primarily in areas of educational psychology and special education. Prior to his work in higher education, he worked in K through 12 education system as an EA or education assistant. And in particular, his research interests include social inclusion, disability studies in education, attitudes toward inclusion and disability, anti-ableism and educational assistance. So with that, much to discuss, I'll turn it over to Dr. Freer. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction and thank you for having me here today. I'm very excited to be able to talk to you a little bit about my research program. And um, I just wanna give a couple of uh, quick uh, notes, as uh, Leslie pointed out, um, I'm going to be uh, home on leave right now, so my children are here, so if there's a little background noise, I want to apologize in advance, but they've been thoroughly warned <laughs> to stay quiet throughout the presentation, so um, so uh, I didn't say threatened, I said warned right now, okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, so today I'll be talking about illuminating and eliminating invisible barriers. Uh, um, this is basically the body of work that our team has done on children's attitudes towards disability and ableism in schools. So the goals for today's session um, is to explore uh, the tripartite intervention, which is a um, series of lessons, also known as the ABC educational program that I developed during my doctoral work at the University of Windsor. Uh, I'll also talk to you a little bit about, um, about how children, what we learned about how children actually conceptualize the term disability and how that affects their framework for developing attitudes and friendships with their peers with disabilities. And finally, we're, we'll explore um, students' attitudes um, towards disability and the associated factors. So uh, a little bit about me, I guess. Uh, this is a picture from my hometown, Windsor, Ontario. I'm actually in a small town next to Windsor called LaSalle, Ontario. And um, this is right at the riverfront. And if, uh, um, if you have anyone that's uh, familiar with Michigan, you can see that this is Detroit right uh, on the other side from us. And um, and you know it's such a nice, convenient thing to have uh, and grow up on a border city, being able to have the best of the American and Canadian cultures. Uh, my mom's actually American and my dad's Canadian, so that's true of my home uh, upbringing as well. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, our riverfront in Windsor. This is the Ambassador Bridge, currently being replaced by the new Gordie Howe Bridge. But for now, this is the uh, nice photo, nicest photo I could find that uh, um, shows some solidarity between Canada and the U.S. Um, and for the um, presentation, what I hope to do today is um, talk to you about what I believe are the three key elements of inclusive, inclusive education. I wanna talk to you about a framework called Disability Studies in Education. You may be familiar with it, but it may be new to some, some folks. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about ableism and how it exists in our education system. And then I'll talk about what our research teams uh, have been doing to sort of address um, the attitudinal barriers that exist in education for students with exceptionalities and disabilities. Um, I'll first highlight four papers that we published recently and then talk to you about what we're working on now that builds directly off that work. <clears throat> and finally, uh, I'll end by talking about some practical implications um, and some resource sharing so that if you're a teacher, or you know a teacher, uh, or uh, if you find it applicable to your particular background, uh, you can 
utilize these things um, to enrich inclusive education. So I'm hoping to cover all of that, but we'll see. Um, Dr. Cottrell is going to keep me on time, I know. Uh, so uh, I, um, uh, I'll i do my best to be brief, although that's not necessarily my specialty. <laughs> all right. So um, in from my view, and, and others uh, hold a similar view, um, there are three major important elements of inclusive education. Um, students need physical, academic, and social inclusion. So the physical inclusion is just that students need to be together. They need to be in the same space. They need to learn in the same classroom uh, and be with their peers. Now, I know people will argue back and forth of whether or not a self-contained or special classroom might be a better placement for certain students. Um, but in my view, anyways, um, I believe that there's a lot more gained by being with your peers, same age peers, um, than can be achieved in another environment. Uh, so that you lose out on all the social capital that's built, you know, so that when, you know, the child who has an exceptionality who otherwise would have been in a special class is, um, you know, sitting next to their peers in class, and then they grow up and they go on a job interview, you know, maybe the person interviewing them is someone they went to school with that can vouch for them. And so this addresses other barriers like employment as well. Um, so that's a prerequisite. Uh, it's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition for inclusion because I've unfortunately observed the cases where students with exceptionalities are in the classroom, but they're not being included in the classroom. And for, the, and for that reason, there are two other elements, um, but physical is sort of that accessibility piece, that very first stage, that, that's, um, that necessary condition. Um, then we have academic inclusion. So in addition to the student being in the classroom, if they're off on a corner on their own little desk doing their own work, they're not actually learning together with their peers. Learning together is really important. So when there are group projects, students can contribute at their level. We talk about things like partial participation, where students can participate at their, at their own level and be a part of something bigger. So for example, if the class is putting on a play, um, you know, maybe there's st uh, certain students who take on different roles um, based on their abilities and needs. And finally, where my area of interest is, is something called social inclusion. And this is that students need to have meaningful opportunities to play and interact with one another. Um, so it's not enough that students are in the same classroom as their peers, uh, are learning alongside and with their peers, uh, but are they actually being played with at recess? Are they being invited into the four square match? Are they being invited to birthday parties? Um, that's a social inclusion. And the, the, the truth of the matter is educators have very uh, important roles to play with regards to this, but most of the power lies in the hands of the peers themselves, children, um, because there are lots of unwritten rules in school. I'm sure it's very similar in the States, but in Canada, if you are in grade one, you're not sitting at the back of the bus where the grade eights sit. There's a hierarchy, there's a pecking order. Um, you know, this is, these are the unwritten rules of school. And, um, and so peers play such an important role in this. And so what our team is interested in is, are there any preconceived notions that students have about disability? Where are they getting that information from? And what's an ideal time to start teaching students about more progressive understandings of disability? So I've kind of already stole my own thunder here by talking about stuff on this slide. But uh, as I mentioned before, peers play a critical role in social inclusion um, and feelings of belongingness. That's a really key, important idea when it comes to inclusive education. Does the student feel like they're, they belong in the classroom? Um, what we know is that when left unexamined, students' attitudes towards disability can pose a social barrier for children with exceptionalities. We know from the literature that students with disabilities are more likely to be at risk for bullying, uh, isolation, and loneliness. And, um, and part of that, at least, at least in part, is due to um, uh, preconceived notions and poor attitudes towards disability. So the good news, though, is that we know that attitudes can be shaped at young ages um, through educational opportunities, uh, and these can have lasting effects. So some studies showing that the effects of intervention in elementary school um, lasting all the way um, until you know eight, eight years later, the, those, those uh, gains are still being observed. So it's very exciting. So what our team does is we look at disability through a disability studies and education lens. And so if you're not familiar with disability studies and education, I'll just give a really short overview. Um, but basically what it does, it takes the theories from the field of disability studies, which is fairly 
a relatively newer field, um, but you know it's been around a while now. Um, and it applies it to inclusive education. So we're taking ideas about disability and applying it now to education. So one um, sort of uh, uh, idea from disability studies is this, this contrast between the medical model and the social model of disability that some of you may be familiar with. But if you're not, uh, very quickly, the medical model is more the disability is within the person and the person needs to be fixed or remedied or cured. And that is the focus. Um, now, that idea has been criticized, although there have been some good things that have come from the medical model in terms of medical advancements. But the social model cr really criticizes the, 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 the medical model by saying, well, it's not necessarily just the disability within the person. There's also this environment that disables people. Um, you know, and sort of the the um, the easiest example is is a ramp at the entrance of a library, right? So uh, we know the knowledge and, and access is up there, but if if there's no ramp and there's just a big giant staircase, like um, I think it's Philadelphia, right? That has a big giant staircase going up to. Hopefully, they have a ramp there now. Um, but I'm thinking of the movie Rocky, and um, and you know, you can you, you you is it the person the fact that the person uses a wheelchair. The disabling factor, or is it the fact that the staircase is in the way of them accessing this building and this knowledge? Um, so, so it's really key that we start to think about disability from an environmental perspective, at least in part. Like interactionist model will acknowledge that disability is, you know, in part medical and in part social, um, and you know, um, pure purist social will say it's all environment, purist medical will say it's all biological. Um, but so what we know is that there are barriers in the environment you know, that's that's a pretty fair statement to make. And some of these barriers are obvious, like that ramp that I was just talking, or the lack of a ramp that I was just talking about. Uh, but some of the um, the barriers are actually um, invisible, um, like attitudinal barriers. And so our, our research team really takes an anti-ableist stance by trying to address some of the ways in which our education systems developed, because in many ways they were developed to exclude uh, people who quote unquote, couldn't learn, a myth in education, a horrible myth in education that's probably robbed us of uh, an, an, an unmeasurable amount of potential because people actually believe that they can't learn or they're not good learners. And that's just not how it works. Um, so I don't have time to get at that. That's my other research interest. But um, so for now, though, let's just acknowledge that there are attitudinal barriers. And some of those attitudinal barriers can be ideas that children or adults have about disability and how it affects social inclusion. So if you're skeptical and you're like, well, you know, ableism doesn't really exist in schools, you know, that's not happening. Here's some, here's some facts. So um, there is a lack of disability representation uh, in the classroom. So when a person with a disability comes into a classroom, um, they're less likely to see themselves reflected in their learning space and see themselves reflected in their curriculum. People with disabilities have a very rich history. It's a very sad and um, uh, um, horrific history um, from genocidal efforts to um, all kinds of horrible things that I don't have to get in. I don't have time to get into today. But people with disabilities, their history is often written on the, it's said to be written on the margins of historical texts. They were always there, but they're always sort of hidden away and part of the story. Uh, and so that is in and of itself a, a factor that, um, that disadvantages people in a sense. Um, bias against disability continues to persist. So there's a link here. Um, and I don't know, Dr. Charlotte, can I make these slides available to the to the group afterwards? Is that a possibility? Absolutely. Okay, so so you could check this out. I've, I've linked a lot of things into the slides here. So it's hopefully an interactive thing. So you can check some things out in addition to what I talk about today. This um, uh, article from uh, Bloorview, which is a, a Children's Hospital in Toronto, um, they have a blog and they interviewed a Harvard professor who looked at implicit bias. And they noted that implicit bias is decreasing for all kinds of groups who are um, who are, have been historically marginalized, but disability is staying stable. It's The bias is very, um, very strong against disability. So that still exists today. That's a, a recent study that's been published. Um, there's also a uh, lack of access Worldwide, um, many, many students with disabilities are just flat out excluded from education because um, of their disability. And um, furthermore, my own observations through, through my experience, I've noted that, that exclusionary practices even occur when students are said to be included. So I mentioned earlier, when a student's at the back of a classroom in a corner, working at their own little desk, doing their own little thing, 
and the rest of the class there. And they say, look, we have an inclusive classroom. It's like physical inclusion, yes. Academic and social needing a little bit of work. So these are just some of the things that um, that prop up ableism in our in our education system. And I don't think it's that different um, in the U.S. versus Canada. In fact, many of these studies um, are, were, were, were done in the States. I know uh, Favaza, uh, Patty's work here um, was done in the States and the Harvard study was done in the Eastern U.S. So um, so actually that's that, that might be a worldwide because they collect a lot of data. But anyway, anyways, I digress. So I guess for a little bit of an interaction piece, you can put this in the chat if you wish, or you can throw your mic on. Uh, maybe that might be a lot of people coming in. So maybe let's use the chat. Um, what preconceived notions about disability might children be exposed to, do you think? So what preconceived notions might children with disability, or might children be uh, exposed to around disability? So let's see if I can see the chat here. Uh, there it is. Okay. So go ahead and, and type some ideas in. What sort of messaging in the media, even at home with their parents, or what type of messaging about disability might students be receiving? Disability equals less than or limited. The can't mentality, that if they interact somehow, you might catch it. Yeah, that was a, I have a, a side story about that. Maybe I'll get into later. Um, that those students are not normal. Yep. Disabled uh, kids are stupid or something is wrong with them. Uh, unattractive. Yeah. So some really good um, ideas here. Um, and, you know, it, it didn't take a lot of prompting and we can all see that these are ideas that sometimes get portrayed in our, um, sorry, in our society. Another, another a great one is uh, pity, feeling sorry for them um, and, and behavioral issues. Good. So some of the ones that I've identified here and, and your ideas are great too. Uh, I really, especially like the idea of unattractive because the beauty standards, absolutely. There's a, there's totally a preconceived notion there as well. Um, but shame, there was a, in each of these, each of these um, attitudinal barriers had their heyday, but there's still remnants of them in our current society. But shame was a big, um, uh, was a big um, uh, model, I guess you could say attitudinal barrier that existed for people with disability. Pity was another one that had its heyday around uh, Jerry Lewis's March of Dimes events. Um, charity model was also a part of that as well. Um, but I would say more my generation, came, we grew up under, uh, thinking that people with disabilities are an inspiration. There's all kinds of movies about them being an inspiration. Um, and that on its surface seems like a good thing until you realize that the ethos behind that is really um, that they're underestimated or you don't expect a lot from them. Um, and I'm going to show you a, a resource to a TED talk later that you can check out on your own. And, and many of you mentioned um, deficit thinking, this idea that um, the word itself, disabled, right? Not able. Um, it creates this deficit thinking about, about disability experiences. So what I want to do is I want to move to more uh, and help students understand more of a rights-based perspective. And I want them to value human diversity. And I want them, and I want students to focus on breaking down uh, barriers when they see them. So calling out ableism when they see it, or, um, or you know, if there's no ramp and the class, there's only that one class, and it's in a, a different area of the school, and there's no access. You know, um, being an advocate and talking and and understanding these things. So some examples, um, some more examples of negative or ableist uh, examples, maybe more modern examples, um, is. Deficit thinking. So, for example, like in the movie Me Before You, if you've seen it before, it sends a message that disability is a fate worse than death. And I love this quote here. Um, From an early age, many people encounter the view that disability is negative and tragic. Um, Stella Young does this amazing TED talk about what she calls inspiration porn. And she's, she purposely calls it that because it's the exploitation of people with disabilities for um, the benefit of people that don't have disabilities. So, you know, memes that you see online of someone in the gym um, and they're in a wheelchair and it says, what's your excuse or something like that. And, and, and that person's just going to the gym. It's that's, that's not something that we need to be inspired about necessarily, but we're, we exploit people with disabilities in this way. Um, there was this short on, 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 um, YouTube called wheelchair woman's first gym day, hashtag inspirational. And it was the most misogynistic and ableist video I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, it, it was just all the comments were like, good for you for going up to her and telling her that she was doing an awesome job. And I was thinking, this person didn't need you to come up to them. They're just at the gym. It's, it's a regular day event. Um, 
And then we mentioned in the chat pity, right? So like this core question, and this person is asking an honest question. I respect that, but this, this model exists. Um, they say, what can I do if I feel extremely sad for people with disabilities? I get overwhelmed with emotions. Um, so, and I've talked to people before and they're like, I can't stop feeling sad. And I'm like, well, let's, you know, unpack that. Where is that coming from? Um, because the person with disability doesn't want you to feel sad for them. Um, and, you know, and they, they, and people with disabilities have said this, you know, this is not just my, my words, but a community of people with disabilities have, have come out and said, like, we don't want to be an object of pity. Um, so we have to be mindful of the wishes of, of people. Um, but there are some examples of positive or progressive examples in the media as well. So when they include real a a um, actors uh, or actresses with disability lived experiences, um, right in the mantra of the disability rights moving, movement, nothing about us without us. Um, when a person with disability does something truly amazing, we should be inspired. So people with disabilities do amazing things and they, they should be celebrated. So when, and I, I you know, I picked a, a picture here of, of Canada scoring on the US. It was a little bit of a, uh, <laughs> taking a shot here, uh, you know, but uh, this is the sledge hockey team here, um, Canada. And when they won gold, that should be celebrated as a true achievement, right? What we don't want to um, do is infantilize um, uh, people with disabilities by celebrating their existence or the fact that they got out of bed that day or the fact they went to the gym. But when they do something truly amazing, it should be celebrated like everyone else. Um, and when disability is part of the whole story or character, but not the focus of the story, right? So I love the movie Finding Nemo for that reason. Nemo has one fin that's a little smaller than the other, and it comes up in the movie a little bit, but it's not the focus of the story. The focus of the story is about this journey and this character development that's happening uh, between a father and a son um, and, and, uh, and a, a short-term uh, memory <laughs> and a friend with short-term memory loss. Um, but, but uh, you know, it's, it's a great movie because it, it really doesn't showcase Nemo's disability as any of these negative models, but it's just part of the story. And that representation is really, really important. So now that we kind of have an idea about the framework, disability studies and education, the attitudinal barriers and ableism that exists in school, I want to talk a little bit about what we've done recently to sort of help to um, begin to address this issue and then where we're headed going uh, forward. And finally, at, at the end, I'll, I'll provide some resources as well. Does anybody, this is sort of a natural transition slide. So is, does anybody have any questions or comments before I move on? Just checking the chat and loving picture of the wrestler here. That's awesome. Thanks, uh, Eric, for sharing that. Okay. If any questions come up, feel free to, to jump in. So the first um, our article I want to talk about is um, was published in Disability and Society, and it's called A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words, um, Examining Students' Understandings of Disabilities in Definitions and Drawings. And this was a really simple study. I went to a class of students and I asked them to tell me what their definition of disability is and write it down using symbols, pictures, words, however they want to do that. And then I asked, and then I said, um, a student is coming to your class that has a disability. Please draw them below and then describe their disability. And I was just curious in how are students defining the word disability? What framework is it? Is it, is it deficit? Is it pity? How is the definition coming out? And what types of disabilities come to mind? Because disability is not a monolith. It's a very diverse experience, rich, diverse, even within categories, it's rich and diverse. You know, I'm sure you've heard the saying before, you met a person with autism, you met one person with autism, right? That's true of every disability, right? Everyone's an individual. Um, and so, um, what we did was we we, uh, we had them fill out these things. And what we found was that most students drew characters in wheelchairs. And that's not that surprising for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, that's the international symbol for disability. When you're looking for a parking space and you need a dis uh, disability parking space, um, there's a wheelchair there, right? So that, that symbol is constantly on the minds of uh, of ch uh, children because it's a symbol that's that's uh, available to them all the time. And it's something that's overt and easy to draw. Um, but interestingly, students also drew characters with autism, um, students with sensory exceptionalities, and one student even drew a student with a learning disability. What's interesting about this is learning disabilities make up the vast majority of students with disabilities in schools. Um, like, a, like there's a, a lot of students um, with learning disabilities, more than any other category by far, uh, at least in Ontario, um, based on the statistics, but I suspect it's similar elsewhere. 
but this was the least, and, and part of that is probably because um, it's just difficult to represent. Um, and when I asked the students to provide their definitions, many of them defined the word the way in which the word exists. This ability, not able, very much a deficit perspective, focusing on the disadvantages of that lived experience. So I think that speaks a little bit to the importance of using terminology like exceptionalities we use in Ontario. You may have heard me uh, mentioning that word throughout, um, or dis slash ability. Um, so language matters, and, and the, the language that children are exposed to at a very young age matters as well. So now that we had an idea of how students actually conceptualize disability, so how they actually think about the word um, in writing, written in uh, an illustrated form, uh, I really wanted to understand what their attitudes were. But before I could understand their attitudes, I wanted to know what had been done, right? It was, uh, I think it was Isaac Newton who said, if I was able to see further, it's because I stood on the shoulder of giants, right? And that was really the, the, the focus of doing a, a systematic literature review. I wanted to know what had been done recently on this topic and you know, where, where is the state of, of the current field of study? So what I did was I um, had a set of search criteria and I narrowed it down to 37 articles and I basically found there are two major subfields in this, in this area of study. There's determinant studies that, that look at things like gender, um, exposure and con contact experience. Right. Getting a little feedback here. Is that me? Um, I, I got it, sorry. Thank you. Um, type of disability, how old the participants were, whether or not they were knowledgeable about disability or not, and what their parents and teachers attitude. So lots of different um, sort of determinant factors. And then I looked at the intervention uh, literature and I found that generally speaking, when you teach kids about disability, it's effective in making their attitudes more positive. Um, and what I also found interesting is that there was this big gap that needed to be addressed that I'll talk about in a moment. The themes that developed from this systematic literature review include better together. I guess I was inspired by Jack Johnson's song when I was writing this. Um, but uh, this was basically the idea that in every case, uh, in any case, uh, contact was a huge factor. The more students are with their peers with disabilities, the more positive their attitudes are. This is a big selling feature for inclusive education. Um, and then there was um, the gaps in the literature. And I found a variety of gaps that I don't have time to go into fully today, but this was the gap that I wanted to focus on for my dissertation. So, excuse me. What was most interesting to me is that most people who are um, measuring attitude uh, in this field define it specifically using something called the tripartite theory of attitude. In other words, they acknowledge that attitude is in part um, your feelings, your in part your behavior, and in part your thoughts or cognitions, right? This fits nicely in with how prejudice develops, discrimination, and stereotyping. So they were measuring using these metrics that have three subscales, affect, behavior, cognition, affect, behavior, cognition. And then when they were going to teach kids about disability, they just had an awareness event where they said, oh, this is what autism is, and this is what cerebral palsy is, and this is what Down syndrome is. Um, and so they're really only targeting the cognitive dimension. And so I thought that's a, that's a pretty um, glaring gap. Um, you know, we're, we're saying this is how attitude is defined. And yet when we go to change it, we're really not addressing the feelings and we're not really addressing the actions either. Um, now, the limited research that did exist found that, um, that the cognitive dimension was effective anyways. But when there was a cognitive and a behavioral dimension targeted, um, it was even more effective. And almost no study had targeted the affective dimension until um, I decided to create a new intervention, which I called the tripartite intervention for researchers. Uh, and then for teachers, I called the ABC education program, affect, behavior, and cognition. And the details of this particular 12 lesson intervention can be found in the Journal for Disability Studies and Education. Uh, I, I map out every lesson there and um, you know, I, I encourage teachers to uh, engage in some of these things and sometimes do professional development uh, for teachers before they engage with their class so that they're, they're prepared because not every teacher has a background in disability studies, for example. Um, so I had an expert panel of 15 people go through this, uh, actually 14 of the 15 I invited went through it, uh, and I made some changes based on that, and I also made some changes based on the first pilot study run through that I did. But to give you a high level overview, um, there are two units of six lessons. Um, there are two cognitive behavior and affective lessons in each unit, 
And in the first six lessons, what we do is we talk to students about disability. Um, so we do that activity that I showed you in this slide, where I have students draw and come up with definitions. Uh, we also have students create a mind map of all the different disabilities they know, so they can really understand the diverse experience of disability. We introduce students to the idea of inclusivity and what that means. Um, and in the behavioral uh, lessons, uh, and, and sorry, in the cognitive lesson number two, we also use critical literacy. This is a really important piece as well. So we use books, storybooks with positive representation of disability to explore ideas. And then in the behavioral dimensions, um, I had students do some role playing of different scenarios around inclusivity. And um, and the uh, the fourth lesson, the, uh, the second behavioral lesson, we we're in the gym playing cooperative games um, with, uh, with, with students with and without exceptionality. So they're working towards common goals. And in the affective lesson, we actually have students reflect on their experience and specifically talk about what feelings they had. And we, we even took the time to build an emotional literacy with students to say, okay, so what are some feeling words that you know, and what do they mean? And we built this huge mind map and uh, um, so that students would have a vocabulary for describing the feelings that they were experiencing. In unit number two, we really focus more um, less on an introduction and more on disability in sports specifically. Um, there's a rich literature uh, that suggests that disability in sports is a great place to teach students about strength-based perspectives of disability. Um, and so uh, the two cognitive uh, lessons in this particular unit focus on introducing to st uh, students to um, the Paralympics and different para, uh, para sports. And we selected sledge hockey in part because we're Canadian and we love hockey. Um, and we had students um, in the behavioral lessons actually get the opportunity to meet athletes and um, get into a sled in a roller sled in a gym, uh, learn the game, and in lesson 10, actually play sledge hockey with Paralympic athletes from Canada. And in the affective lesson, again, students are, were really prompted to think about their feelings using some of those emotional literacy words we developed. And they were also encouraged to um, think about empathy from a critical perspective, not from a pity perspective. So um, the findings of this particular um, pilot were published in the Journal for Research in Special Education Needs. Um, and what I found with this very small group of students was that there was an, a, a significant increase uh, or significant interaction effect um, between, uh, for the cognitive dimension of attitude. So when I took the cognitive dimension of the scale that I was using, which was the catch scale, um, and I looked at that specifically, what I found is that students who participated in um, the, the lessons had significantly higher, um, more progressive ideas and thoughts about disability, which seems to me like a good place to start, right? If we can't necessarily, behavior and feelings are really deep and, and difficult to change. Um, as, a, as a new parent, I'm learning that behavior is difficult to change because, uh, you know, there's, you're constantly, you know, working with your kids and be, behavior modifying and so on and so forth. So um, behavior is challenging and, um, and so is feelings because they're very deep rooted, but, but thoughts, thoughts can be affected. And um, that, it seemed to me that this was a good place to start, but it was a very small study. So there was much work to be done still. And that really is what brings us to today. So um, currently, our team uh, is just finished examining um, uh, attitudes. Uh, so we hit COVID, of course, like everyone, and we, we couldn't get in the classrooms and do the sledge hockey and all that stuff that we wanted to do. So we broke our study into two phases. During COVID, we were able to virtually collect data with uh, about 200 participants, um, students uh, grades four to six, roughly speaking. There were actually exactly 192 um, participants. And what I wanted to know was what were their attitudes towards disability on the catch scale. But I also wanted to measure things that my literature review told me had never been measured before, like, is there any impact of personality? And what about um, growth versus fixed mindset? Um, so I'll talk to you about the, the, the findings of that study in a moment, because we have those that we have that data, um, but it hasn't been published yet. So you'll be, it is hot off the press for you folks. Um, and we're currently conducting phase two of that study, which is a, now that COVID's lifted, uh, restrictions are lifted, and we're able to get into the schools, we're just wrapping up the, uh, the tripartite intervention with a much larger sample than the original. So we're hoping to find um, some replication data um, with regards to that cognitive intervention, but maybe even some other things as well. So if you want updates for that, I've left my the link to my Google Scholar and ResearchGate here. So when you have these slideshows, you can just um, you know add me on 
ResearchGate or check out the Google Scholar. As soon as something gets published, it usually will pop up there. Um, in lieu of that, you can always email me. I'll, I'll provide my email uh, at the end. Just somebody might remind me because I'm not sure it's in my slideshow. So phase one of this project was funded by the WeSpark Health Institute uh, in partnership with Parasport Ontario. And phase two of this project um, is currently under review at MyTax um, for uh, funding and is uh, in partnership with Canadian Tire Jumpstart Charities um, and Canadian Tire um, Corporation and Parasport Ontario as well. So here's what we found. Um, unsurprisingly, based on the literature review, because we know the literature quite well at this point, um, contact or experience with disability predicted more positive attitudes towards disability. Uh, it wasn't particularly surprising, um, but important. I wrote an article recently uh, on about adults, and it was called Experiences Matter. And it was all about how the experiences you have with people with disabilities is one of the most effective tools for um, um, uh, being uh, reducing bias and, um, and, and whatnot. Uh, so when we looked at personality, there were no major significant findings on um, many of the big five. So the big five personality factors, if you're not familiar, are conscientiousness. So that's like hard work ethic and orderliness. Um, uh, what else? Uh, neuroticism. So that breaks down into um, uh, withdrawal and volatility, roughly speaking. Uh, then you have extroversion, which is like people who are really enth enthusiastic and assertive. And... Um, I'm saving agreeable for the last. There's one more uh, openness to experience uh, and openness to experience is, you know, um, create basically your creativity, intellectual dimension, but agreeableness, which is one, which is the last one I saved for last on purpose um, is uh, breaks into compassion and um, and politeness. And so interestingly, uh, people who were more agreeable had more positive attitudes. So people who had more of a uh, more of a proclivity for compassion um, we're more likely to um, have positive attitudes towards disability. Now, this could be because people who are more polite might be more subject to things like social desirability, or it could be that people that have more of a capacity for compassion uh, or more of a, not, not a capacity, that's the wrong word, more, more of a proclivity for compassion are more likely to have positive attitudes. And this may actually explain a really interesting finding from the field when I did the literature review, which was that um, females had way more positive attitudes than males on average across the 37 um, studies that I looked at. And so um, it, it, it also is the case that uh, females tend to score higher on agreeableness. So, you know, it's interesting. This may be a, mitigate, uh, a, mitigate, a mediating factor uh, when it comes to um, uh, attitudes towards disability, but that, that data needs to still be fleshed out with more research. Um, if you're not familiar, I'll just quickly describe fixed mindset and growth mindset. Carol Dweck of Stanford University um, sort of came up with this idea that there are people who believe that they can change their ability levels, whether it's intelligence or whether it's um, any skill. Um, so some people believe that they can work at something and the harder you work, the better you'll do. And some people believe, you know what, I'm just not a math person or I'm, I'm just not very handy with, with tools. Uh, and there's no changing that, right? So people who generally believe that that they can't change and they're just they they're just stuck where they are on a variety of different dimensions. Um, that is a, called a fixed mindset. And people who believe I'm not great at this right now, but I could work at it and get better. Um, and th those people would be more described as having a growth mindset. So what we found interestingly is that people that scored low on a fixed mindset scale. So in other words, they had a growth mindset. Um, were more likely to have positive attitudes towards disability. And that is um, the first such finding on this particular. Um, uh, this particular topic. So that was really interesting. Now we also had qualitative data. So we re we replicated that work that we, uh, we did earlier with the, the definitions and the drawings. And we found that the definitions basically fell into four categories. One was undefined. So it's not really a true category. Um, these are participants that left the question blank, or they put a disability means that you're you have a disability or something that was very difficult to interpret. Um, the three categories, other categories that um, that came up were um, otherness or deficit thinking, which was the major category found in the original pilot. But we also did find that some students had inclusive responses. And some of the responses were just labels and symbol, uh, symbols, uh, symptoms, excuse me. So labels and symptoms were like things like, I picture my sister because she's deaf. So they're, they're taking a label, deafness, and they're using that to describe disability as such. 
Um, the example of inclusive, uh, an inclusive response is the word disability means that someone may be different, but that does not mean that they're not smart or bad. Um, and another deficit definition from a child might be, uh, it means that someone is sick or that they cannot do something. This is a really key thing. They cannot do something, right? It's a deficit idea. Uh, for example, they can't walk, they can't hear, they can't speak. Now, most of the participants didn't fall into one category. Oftentimes, they fell into several categories. And especially interestingly, at least as far as I'm concerned, is inclusive and otherness was, were the two that were paired together most often. They would say something you know, rather ableist about a student, and then they'd say, but you know, uh, one of the favorite of the research team was, at the end, they put, but no hate. You know, uh, we actually titled a conference presentation, No Hate, uh, with, the, with the quotes at the front. Um, so, you know, the kids were, the children were, um, were have complex definitions uh, of disability and, and, and um, they show a great interest and um, they're thirsty for more knowledge and understanding of this, um, this diversity in the classroom and elsewhere. The pictorial themes with 192 students were much more complex than what they were with my smaller pilot study. Um, and there was a lot more categories represented. We had physical disabilities still as the most popular, but we also had sensory, which we had last time, developmental disabilities, learning disabilities, uh, mental health came up. This was a brand new category that wasn't captured in the pilot. We thought that was really interesting because there is more and more um, anti-stigma campaigns around mental health and children at younger and younger ages are learning more and more about different um, mental um, mental health um, concerns and whatnot. So uh, that was really interesting. And we also noticed that unprompted students put really, really positive things or really, really negative things about people with disabilities. So we also created a positive and negative, which was often a secondary category to one of the five uh, above. And then there was another category that was really, like really unique. They, some students mentioned like really unique disabilities um, that didn't really fit into a category because it was like a one-off, but it created this other category. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna try to wrap it up soon so we have time for questions here, um, but some discussion here first. So um, a couple of things to remember. Attitudinal barriers are invisible, um, but they pervade our system of quote unquote, inclusive education. Deficit and inclusive thinking about disability underlays, um, deficit versus inclusive education underlays attitudinal barriers in schools. Um, mostly children drew physical disabilities, but definitions were mostly rooted in deficit thinking. Um, these findings underscore the need for further instruction on diverse disability experiences and inclusivity. In fact, one such researcher whose name is escaping me right now said that it is our ethical obligation as teachers to introduce students to diverse experiences, including diverse disability experiences. Once again, contact speaks to the importance of inclusive education in general, that physical inclusion, that being together as a prerequisite um, to create authentic social and academic opportunities for students with exceptionalities. Um, so we get those other elements of inclusion as well. Uh, further researchers needed to explore different psychological factors. So our study was the first to look at personality and mindset, but there's so many other psychological factors that could be examined that are been unexamined. And interestingly, we had this new mental health theme, which is really interesting. So I'm interested to see uh, what future studies will say uh, with regards to that. So it wouldn't really be a great presentation if I didn't take a time at the end and give you some things that you can take home or you can use in your classrooms if you're teachers or you can pass along to your uh, friends who are teachers. Um, so how can you start applying some of these research findings to your work? Well, um, the link here, the first one, and you'll have these later, will link you to that article that has all of the um, information needed to implement these 12 lessons in your schools. Um, I've also developed a list of critical literacy um, so these are books that have positive disability representation that can be integrated into classrooms quite seamlessly. Again, being part of the story and not about this, not just about disability. You know, you shouldn't start the lesson by saying, we're going to read a book and there's a character in here that has autism. And I really want you to focus on that. Just read the book and kids will be exposed to new ideas. And that's, that's the whole point. Um, so this link here will take you to the, I think the university of Toronto and their list that they've created, but I've also created uh, a handout. Um, that you might find useful as well, which I think is in the notes section. Uh, encourage progressive representation of disability in the classroom. So use posters like the one you can see here. Um, there's also uh, this one we created with our um, 
folks in um, the Caribbean who were working on transitioning them over to inclusive education, where the whole community put their handprints. Um, we had an artist do the mural. Uh, these are a couple posters that my students developed. So treat others the way you want to be treated. Remember to keep it authentic. These are the rules for inclusion. Uh, and another poster here. So these types of posters up in the school send a message that this is a positive place where inclusion is happening and disability experiences are um, represented in the, in the space. Um, you can select multimedia uh, with diverse disability experience in them. And I've linked a couple uh, here as well. One about sledge hockey, uh, one animated video called The Present. Uh, I've included an article by another uh, set of scholars uh, that provide 20 strategies for integrating disability studies and education in the classroom. And um, I just want to remind you, I guess the key thing, the take home thing here, that if you don't remember anything else that I talked about today, is we need to move beyond awareness. It's not enough just to teach people about disability, um, but we, it's a good first step. But what our findings really suggest is that there's great value in extending beyond this and understanding um, how students' feelings and their actions also influence social inclusion as well. So that's all I have for today. Um, uh, I think I've left myself about 12 minutes for questions. So uh, hopefully we can have some uh, interactive discussions at this time. So thank you very much for taking time out of your day. And I hope you found a nugget of uh, knowledge in there somewhere. Yeah, that was terrific. Appreciate that. So um, we'll continue to watch the chat. Um, please put your questions in there or raise your hand or unmute, either one. And don't be shy. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for sharing those resources at the end as well. Like I, I often hear from parents and families that they want to teach their kids about others who have disabilities, but they just don't know how to. And you know, there's certain things out there like Sesame Street and and things like that. But often that's not enough. So I appreciated the resources, yeah. and we'll be sharing those. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Freer? Am I saying yeah. So I wanted to tell you, first of all, I love your presentation. And it's interesting because one of the things that I was just talking to a parent yesterday and I was talking to Dr. Cockrell this morning about it. One of the things that I'm finding that, so I do psychotherapy and I work, on prim I, mer I work primarily with uh, students and people in the community who have disabilities and maybe those who are the parents of a child with a disability. One of the things I found that technique wise that we do here that's really interesting for, for me, like if I get to know you, like and I talk to you about you, right? I talk to you about how noise messes with you mm -hmm. and you tell me how it is and I get to know you better, right? You may be a student who does not want to talk about the fact that you're in the spectrum, but you are talking about you. So mm -hmm. I found that when we get you to talk about you, you tend to appreciate the uniqueness of you and you talk about it differently than talking about it from a deficit. You talk about it as these are the attributes about myself. So we, we kind of resource people with their own information. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, and, that makes that makes perfect sense to me. I think that, um, you know, that speaks to like a core principle that I have when I go into this work is that, and I try to impart upon, you know, the teachers that we train to do this kind of work is that every single person is, is, and as I think as a psychotherapist, you'll appreciate this. Every single person needs to be evaluated at the level of the individual. It is important to take into consideration the different groups that people identify with, whether it be disability or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, we're all unique individuals. And as you so eloquently put it, with, with these, these amazing traits that make us uniquely ourselves. And I love that. Yes. You know, the other part, this last thing, Doc, the other thing that I think that we've kind of embraced here, and I got to give it to the leadership here that, that, we, that they support this, is they don't tolerate or accept people. They appreciate people. And mm -hmm. I have found that when you learn to appreciate, I see your uniqueness. Mm -hmm. I, am, I I can see you. I, it's like an avatar moment. I actually see you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I see the response to that is because it's not a reaction. It's a response that we get from the students because they have to think about it. Like, why are you being cool to me? Because you're cool, bro. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's it. And they're like, yeah, I guess I am. And it's not that we're convincing them or massaging that. It is because we are talking about them from an appreciative vantage point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Eric, that's such a valuable thing. I, I sort of alluded to it earlier, but another research interest of mine is, you know, what teachers tell kids when they're little 
and how that affects their whole mentality around their own learning. And that's like teachers have such a power that they may or may not recognize, um, you know, and, um, and, and, you know, you can really make or break a kid. And it's, uh, it's so important that kids see themselves as valuable contributors in the classroom, for sure. Yeah, bro, we, I use rational motor behavioral theory in, in the class all the time. They have no idea that I'm doing rational motor behavioral theory, which is cognitive behavioral. So mm -hmm. I'm doing cognitive behavior. And what do you think about that? What's that make you, how does that make you feel when you tell yourself that? Well, what if you told yourself the truth? <laughs> and they're like, bro, my autism is a superpower, isn't it though? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it just becomes this, this real dope um, awareness of capacity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think about how much human potential was wasted on students who be believed lies about themselves. And I was I was very close to being one of those students myself. I was nearly a high school dropout. When I was a kid, I had epilepsy. Um, uh, I also had ADHD that was undiagnosed and untreated. Um, but, uh, but, you know, uh, I had some teachers who told me really horrible things about, about my learning and I believed it. That was the, the, that was the really horrible thing is I believed what I was being told. But then I had just one teacher. And I tell my, my pre-service teachers this all the time. I just had one teacher that said, no, no, you're going to, you're going to go to university. When you graduate, I want to get an invite to your convocation. And that teacher did get an invite to the convocation, but had she not taken the time after school when she was tired and probably had kids of her own to go home to, to sit down with me and say, Hey, I believe in you, you know, who knows what path I would have been on. Right. But it certainly wouldn't have been to here. <laughs> And I just think about how many people are, you know, like the cure to cancer could have been, can be, can be lost on some kid who told, was told he was stupid when he was young. You know, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just so much human potential wasted. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Erica. That's, that's uh, something for me to think about. I appreciate it. I just want to add, I mean, it's wonderful that you are focusing on the, the age group and the populations that you do in your research. We see the same thing. Uh, in the transition to college for individuals who may not have been able to go to college or, or told that they could go to college. And Eric, Eric and many others on here work with them. Um, but here on campus and many higher education, they also equate accommodations with additional time, something additional I have to do. Um, mm. I have to structure my class differently. That's an add-on. And, and so I think the very same things you're talking about today apply to what many of us do in higher education when they get to that point of no it's not um it's actually not let's think about what this course would look like or what this program would look like for anyone ahead of time and we reduce the amount of work that we need to do and also making it accessible to everyone but that's mm -hmm. i mean even making um accessible syllabi huge deal yeah Right, so it's it's definitely it continues, but starting early, um, and all facets. And I love your three areas, right? Because many of it, many times we think of just the physical. So it was really, really great to see the academic and the social piece. Yeah, it, it comes to mind so much easier because we have easy examples like ramps. Um, in fact, my my colleagues and I at Brock uh, Brock University, another university here in Ontario, uh, we do uh, PD around inclusion, and we we call them the ramps to inclusion. And we talk about social, what, what does a social ramp look like in the classroom? What does an academic ramp look like? And what does a physical ramp look like? And it really helps to open people's eyes about the, the sort of um, the forgotten barriers that are, or the invisible barriers that are there. And check the chat as well after that lovely picture of that wrestler. Um, a lot of people appreciating. Oh, thank you. Your presentation for sure. Thank you very much. Any other questions? We have a couple more minutes. We'll let you get back to your lovely family. Can't thank you enough for sharing your experience, your research. We hope to invite you back. You know, um, so please, we'll continue to watch your work and your career. And uh, just thank you. Thank you for sharing what you do. Oh, thank you for having me. And um, I guess the last thing I would want to say is we have to get away from a focus on changing students, whether it's higher ed or, or elementary or secondary. It's always, you know, again, the social model idea, our, our education is rooted in a medical model. So we're like, what do we need to do to change this kid to make them fit? We got to start thinking about changing the system. And until that happens, there will always be 
disparities in, um, in access for students with disabilities. Okay, everyone has a mission. We have our charging uh, charge. So thank you again. And um, everyone have a nice afternoon. Thanks for joining us for Ability Grand Round. Everyone take Dr. care. Dr. Freer is our brother. Yep. Take care.